Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to Rates and Barrels. Uh, I'm Al Melchior. I am here with Eno Saris. And before we get started here, some very, very big news. Uh, of course, I'm sitting here in the seat uh, normally occupied by Derek Van Riper, and uh, he is a brand new father, baby boy. So uh, best wishes to the Van Ripers and uh, looking forward to seeing him here again soon. But uh, of course, uh, you know, lot, lots to take care of right now. Uh, and we're, Get uh, used to Al, though. You're still going to be around even when Derek comes back to help us out on Fridays. Uh, we're going to have, I think it's going to be, uh, what's the theme? A little bit more kind of nuts and bolts, like waiver rivalry. It's going to be a, bit, a little bit like your waiver wire show in the past uh, brought to the Rates and Barrels feed so that uh, anybody who's sort of thinking about pickups and drops uh, for Sunday fab or uh, that sort of deal. But uh, we're also maybe going to intersperse uh, some interviews. Um, and uh, so we'll get a little taste of that today. Uh, absolutely. So yeah, good sneak preview of some things to come. And uh, we're going to talk about stolen bases, the new environment for stolen bases, the new rules, and how that might affect not only how many bases are being stolen, but uh, how we go about drafting for stolen bases. And related to that, you know, uh, did an excellent interview with Stephen Vogt. So we'll be getting to that in short order here. And before we we dig into this topic, uh, just a quick reminder to everybody that the 2023 Fantasy Baseball Draft Kit will be launching soon on The Athletic. Make sure you head on over to theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. And once you do that, you'll be able to get uh, this deal, $2 a month for the first year. That will get you in the door to all of the content on The Athletic. Uh, of course, that includes the draft kit. And, you know, I know you've got a lot of really uh, great content coming up that people are not going to want to miss. Oh, yeah. I mean, sleepers, sleepers galore. Got uh, 10 breakout young bats, 10 breakout young arms, but also 10 deep sleepers, uh, 300 and 400 plus ADP on those guys, plus uh, pitching projections powered by Stuff Plus that performed really well. I'm really excited to do that. I think it really improved my rankings. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons why I really improved it is that um, when I was looking at Stuff Plus, one of the things I had to do was mentally uh, park adjust, you know? And uh, with projections, you don't have to do it mentally. And so unfortunately, Nick Lodolo fell off a little bit because that's just a really tough park. As excited as we are about him as a pitcher, uh, it's a really tough park and it's a, it's, it's a tough bar for him. So... Uh, it was nice to kind of get that park adjustment in there, get some other regression in there, eat, add some results and and get a, a fuller picture. So that's all coming next week. And uh, if you head over to Rates and Barrels, uh, what is it? The Athletic at Rates and Barrels, uh, the Athletic slash Rates and Barrels dot com. Uh, you can get the deal right now, which is two dollars a month for new subscribers. So that's that's a fun time. Fun thing. Yeah. Yeah. Very fun time. So make sure you uh, check into that. So let's uh, let's dig right in here, Eno, and let's start with um, the the new rules uh, coming into this year. Uh, many of which should have an impact on stolen bases. Have had an impact uh, as they've been tried out in the minor leagues on stolen bases. There. So just a just a quick review here. There's going to be the pitch timer now instituted. Thirty seconds between batters. Fifteen seconds between pitches when the bases are empty. Twenty seconds between pitches when there's at least one runner on base. Uh, and when the pitch timer was instituted in the minors, that resulted in increases in both stolen uh, base attempts per game and in success rates. So in terms of steals uh, attempted per game, that went from 2.23 in 2019 to 2.83 in 2022. And across those same years, an increase in success rate from 68% to 77%. Yeah, and it's really interesting to think about these things. A lot of these rule changes, the shift and all these other ones, I think are going to have a massive effect on a baseball-wide scale. So we're going to look up and be like, whoa, the batting average went up, and there were the, all these more hits, and there are all these more stolen bases. But on the individual player level, I'm not sure how much to buy in. Um, you know, For example, you just cited that uh, stolen bases in the minors went up uh, by over 25%. That's great. Uh, that turns a 20 stolen base guy into 25 stolen base guy. Uh, it's not the kind of thing where we're going to go immediately back to the go-go years of the seventies when, you know, you had multiple Otis Nixon's running around and, 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 uh, you know, I guess that was the, that was more the eighties, but, uh, you know, you had these guys stealing 70, 80, 90 bases. I kind of doubt that we're going to get to a 90 stolen base level. Um, I just, 
you know, the, the, the way that stolen bases are done right now are just so scienced out, you know, did a piece with Andrew Baggerly about how, you know, the game approaches, uh, the stolen base. And it's, it's like, you've, you've got the pop time of the catcher. You've got the time to home from the pitcher and you've got the time to, uh, to second base from the, from the player. And it's math. You know, and you've got the, the break even success rate you need. And so, you know, the break even success rate by the numbers is 67 percent. Um, and I think you said in the minors, it used to be 68 percent. That, right. that pretty perfectly um, in the majors, though, uh, the 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 actual average has gone up to 72, 73, 74 percent across the league, suggesting that, A, they don't want to just break even on stolen bases. They want to win. Um, and B, that maybe they've scienced this to the point where people only take off when they're going to be successful. And how much will four inches really change that for Trey Turner? Right. And we'll get to Turner and, and some other, actually quite a few other players uh, in a little bit here. I also want to add just a couple of other rule changes that could impact this. Your, your point's all well taken because I don't know how much these other rule changes are really going to move the needle as well. But pitchers are limited to two pickoffs or step-offs, uh, also known as disengagements. So obviously a lot more pressure to uh, keep the the runners uh, on first uh, and, and maybe not be able to do so successfully as successfully in the past. And also the bases are larger, 15 inches square to 18 inches square. So that could maybe. Yeah, that could, that shortens the base pass by, exactly. by, you know, a little bit under four inches. So the, 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 the one that's the hardest to model and think about because, you know, Tom Tango came out and said, you know, the four inches is pretty easy to model. You can just look at, you know, how fast someone is and how far it is and what that means. It's four inches is 0.15 seconds. What if everybody had 0.15 seconds more, how much more successful would they be? And he did the math and he said it adds 2% to success rate. Um, so that, that, that sounds fine in the, in the sort of abstract. Um, but one thing that is, is that 2% means a lot different. Like Trey Turner is successful, you know, a ton, it, it, what about these people who are true talent? And we also don't know their true talents all the time, right? Like we, we don't know exactly how the, everyone's true talent success rate, but let's say your true talent success rate before these rule changes was 70% and the league average is 75%. They're going to say, don't take off. Thank you. You know, only if you notice no one's paying attention, you know, only if it's the poo holes thing where everyone's doesn't think you're going to steal and you can just sort of jog over, then you can steal. But otherwise, uh, no, thanks. Well, now you're at 72% or if you're at 73, now you get to 75. So I think, you know, there, there's a little bit there where in the middle, it makes a bigger difference than on the edges. There are people that won't steal that, that four inches doesn't matter for and people who are already stealing that four inches doesn't matter for and we have to kind of figure out the middle and it's, it's sort of a theory of mine but we'll a lot of it we're going to see and the other thing is the throws over man how do you do that you know like how do you model that I mean, looked at uh how many people got how many uh players got throws over in in the certain situations i found 10 players average more than one throw over and that's trey turner's number one with like 1.25 so now if you imagine that that means that uh, the average time that he steps out there, he gets one throw uh, at least. And if he gets the one throw, you don't want to throw the second time because you can throw a third time, but then you give him second base if you don't get him. Right. So, uh, so you really don't want to throw that second time. And, uh, and so that game of poker could have, could have immense results or none, or I don't know. Um, but we, we covered that a little bit with, with Steven boat in terms of, uh, what that sort of cat and mouse game. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned that this like lar largely have an impact for kind of the middle range base dealers. And so we'll talk about some examples of players that, that fall in there. But before we get to that, before we get to your interview with, uh, with Steven, uh, let's just talk about the, the high end for a little bit. You've already mentioned Trey Turner. Uh, also, I just want to bring up a, a quote that I saw just a little while ago, uh, before we started talking today, uh, this is something that was on Twitter from the athletics, Rob beer temple, uh, O'Neill Cruz says he wants to go 30, 30 or 40, 40 this year. Now, I mean, to me, those are two very different things, but <laughs> if you look at what he did as a rookie, the stolen bases definitely have to catch up to the power. I could definitely buy into the home run side of that equation. But do you think that with these rule changes that let's just be conservative and say 30, 30, is that a more realistic expectation for Cruz now? 
I think so. I think so. I mean, even if you just even a 25% increase on the top ends, uh, I think that that gets him close to 30 uh, stolen bases. He has the elite speed. Uh, he's on that top end. Uh, he has the, the the desire, which is actually uh, amazingly a, a big part of it. I do remember, though, it reminds me of something. I was training to be a producer, like an editor uh, for MLB.com. Uh, in, in another lifetime, I don't get that phone call from Fangraphs uh, to offer me a, a job. And I and I am an editor at, at MLB.com. Um, but uh, I was trained to be an editor there. And I edited three stories in three days about how Matt Kemp wanted to go 50, 50. <laughs> uh, he did not narrator. He did not go 50, 50. Uh, so some of this isn't you file in the best shape of his life uh, territory, but I do think it's going to be interesting to see what the top end looks like. We haven't had, uh, you know, a, uh, we haven't had like a 70 stolen base guy since I think Jose Reyes. Um, and right. the game has largely gone away from guys where, you know, speed is their number one tool. Um, but there still are some really fast guys in the league. Like think about Brian Byron Buxton. Does it change the fact that Byron Buxton doesn't want to be injured on the base pass anymore? Um, I don't know. I don't, I think he's still, yes, the bag is bigger. And so maybe, maybe he'll take off some, but, uh, there's an elite base runner that's decided not to, not to steal bases anymore. Yeah. Well, let's go back to Trey Turner. What do you think the ceiling is for him? Yeah. I mean, I would, I just look at the age and I think there's no way he's still, uh, he's still an elite uh, runner, but he is, you know, he's still in the top 10 in, in, in sprint speed. Um, and I don't, I don't really know why there was a bit of a drop off last year in stolen bases. I would figure that some of it has to do with team effects that the Dodgers were just so good um, that, you know, the, like, are you going to take off a lot when Freddie Freeman is batting um, and potentially like run yourself out of an inning? Uh, and I wonder if with Bryce Harper out, if the Phillies decide that, you know, they want to take advantage of these rules and, and, and run a little bit. They aren't other than Turner, a big, uh, fast, young team. But Schwarber did show up on one of my lists as potentially adding uh, some stolen bases that people wouldn't suspect. So what if with Harper out, they decide to steal a little bit? We had Turner stealing 46 and 43 and 17 and 18. Um, I think 45 is a is a reasonable outcome. He's projected uh, for 30. If you add uh, the 25 percent, you get to, uh, you know, the high 30s, you know, with the with the throws over, you know, and the and the and the cat and mouse and the Harper being out. I think he could get over 40. Um but it wouldn't surprise me at all if he just, you know, had 2530 again. All right. Well, you know, given what we've said so far, would this change the way that you would approach steals in in drafts this year? Because I, I've always been somebody, I shouldn't say always, but certainly in recent years have been somebody to kind of hang back and not want to overpay for speed and try to cobble it together uh, with, with very mixed success. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I could see definitely doubling down on that. Uh, that approach this year, given that we could expect a, a little bit uh, more, you know, more sharing of the wealth in, in stolen base category. Uh, is that something you could see yourself doing? Or do you think it's just, you know, do what you've always done uh, because the, the changes are, are not really more than marginal. Yeah, it's uh, it's a tough one. I haven't, I haven't changed what I've done. I, you know, one thing that I think is true is that the secondary effects, like, for example, are we going to get um, more players that are defensive fits in center field that are also really fast? That's not going to happen in year one. I just don't believe that there's a team that's that aggressive. <laughs> you know? Like, I just don't think there's a team that's that together that they're like, oh, we saw this rule coming and we put ourselves like did the guardians build this like singles hitting fast team in a, in appreciate in like thinking this rule was coming? Like I, that would be such a risk, you know, did they sign miles straw to like a five year, $50 million deal knowing that the bases were going to get bigger halfway through it. Like, I don't, like I, don't, I just don't believe that. So, you know, either miles straw is going to lose his job because he can't bat enough to keep it or uh or he's going to keep his job because he bats enough to keep it i don't think that he keeps his job because the bases are bigger and he can steal more bases so i think the secondary effects 
in baseball take longer. Like we saw, for example, the ball was jumping out in 2015. Like the ball was juiced in 2015. And it, over the next four years, uh, people changed their launch angle on hard hit balls by one degree. So we saw some changes in pull rate and, 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 and hard hit rates in the air, <laughs> but it was small and it took a long time. So I, I don't think secondary effects are going to happen. Now, primary effects are more like, will these certain players take off more often? And I just personally think that the math changes more in the middle than the edges. So my approach of getting a bunch of guys that have good speed that will steal five to 10 bags, I, I have a hope that that is actually the right approach. That all right. All right. Those well, we guys will... will see the most increase percentage wise. All right. All right. Well, and again, we're going to talk about a number of those uh, players. But before we do, uh, there's just so much good discussion between you and Stephen Vogt about this and, and, and many other things. So uh, we're going to hand it over. Uh, I'm going to hand it over, you know, to you and Stephen Vogt. And uh, we'll uh, continue this conversation after that. <laughs> And I'm here with Stephen Vogt, uh, now of the Mariners. Uh, uh, excited to have you on, Stephen. Uh, uh, congrats on the new job. Uh, what is it? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, it's the, I guess I'm the the bullpen and slash quality control coach. And uh, so my main, uh, you know, my main job, obviously, in game is going to be in the bullpen, helping the relievers get prepared to come into the game and keeping them up to date on the scouting reports and, and communicating and then just being with them and there for them during the game. But uh, and then that's the quality control aspect is the sort of scouting reports. Is that the, is that there is like a, a statistical aspect to that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think, and that's where the quality control part comes in where I'm going to be involved with the game planning um, <clears throat> on the pitching side, as well as the hitting side. I'm going to be working with the catchers a little bit, but um Quality control is just kind of the title that's like, hey, I'm, I'm kind of working in all areas as well. It's not just bullpen coach. Uh, so I'll, I'll kind of have my hand in on a lot of stuff, whatever, um, whatever the coaching staff and the players need and the front office, whatever they hand down. But a, a majority of my job is going to be with the bullpen guys and obviously the game planning and understanding what, how we're trying to attack the other team's hitters and have a, have a knowledge of that. You know, I, I have so much respect for catchers and, you know, it's actually sometimes difficult uh, to interview catchers uh, in the in the clubhouse because you all have so much to do. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, I just remember like constantly trying to get Buster's attention. He's like, I, I got to I got to do this, you know, um, you know, so could you let me into the the process? I mean, it sounds like you're mimicking a little bit in the new job is like what was uh your day to day operations. What was it like being a catcher? Like what you have so much to prepare for. You have to prepare for every aspect of the game where everybody else can kind of just look at the other pitchers scouting report or whatever. How did you prepare as a hitter, prepare as a framer, prepare as a game caller, prepare as a, a running game stopper? How, what was your day like when you got to the park on an average day? Uh, I mean, it, it is, it's busy. I always felt like if I sat down at my locker, I was being lazy and I shouldn't, I shouldn't be doing that. Right. Um, I, there's always something to be, to be doing, but a typical day for me would be, um, I was, a, I'm a big morning person. And so I would wake up, uh, maybe a little earlier than normal on the days I'm playing and put my, I would get my final kind of scouting report together. You know, sometimes we'd have the lineup, uh, the night before, or, you know, you have a pretty good idea of the matchup and what it's going to look like. And, so at the beginning of the series, obviously you do your notes on the other team and you go through all 13 hitters and um, and have a scouting report generalized right versus right versus left. And as well as getting the information from the organization and the pitching coach and game planning coach, whoever. Um, and then I'd look at the pitchers heat maps if they had their own heat maps. So I would kind of gather everybody's information and then do my own scouting report and kind of marry them all together. Uh, and then knowing who I'm catching and who we're facing, I would get my scouting report for that night. I'd probably do that, you know, eight thirty, nine o'clock in the morning, uh, right before my kids would wake up. And so I'd have that all ready to go. So I knew, all right, going into the day, I already have my game plan. It's made out. It's ready to go. Uh, and then I'd get to the ballpark and I would usually re-go over that scouting report, maybe look at who's umpiring that night. 
and where their mm. zone tends to go. So it's, I know which pitches we can maybe try and expand a little bit where they're going to be tight. And so, you so that's use almost those like areas. a framing scouting report. You're sort of now you're going from game calling into, into the framing aspect a little bit. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and knowing like, Hey, you know, let's say Ted Barrett doesn't give a whole lot off the inside corner. So we're not going to be able to steal anything in there. So when we do go in, it's more for contact, it's more for effect. Whereas he'll, he might expand a little bit off the outside corner. So understanding those and knowing which pitches I need to be ready to frame, coupling that with who's pitching that night. If we can't command the inside part of the plate to the, to the right handers, then why we're not going to try and steal anything in there. Right. So putting all that together and then I would get to the, I'd go to the video room with my scouting report and maybe look at some swings or things like that. And then I would go through my offensive game plan against that starter. So I would look up the starter. So then I'd look up, okay, what's he has tendency, talk to the analytical guys, maybe our video guy and just say, Hey, what have you seen from this? Uh, and then I, so then after that, I'd go to the gym and I'd get my warm up out of the, get my warm up done. Uh, and that takes us right up until I go to the cage do my hitting routine. And then I go out for batting practice. And then right after the first group of batting practice, I'd come in and, um, and I would, I would play, I would play catch before BP. Sorry. I want to make sure I get that in there. Um, mm -hmm. I was always a person that needed to throw a lot. I had two shoulder surgeries and an elbow surgery. So mm -hmm. I found the more I threw, it helped my arm stay in shape better after that, especially. Or yeah, or just on the line, you know, I just go on the line and do that. Um, oh, and this you is mean, on yeah, a day. with the warm up with the players. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I'd, I'd play out to about 120 on that day. And then after BP, we have our starters meeting. And so we'd sit down with the whoever wanted to be involved with that the pitching coach, game planning coach, catcher, mm. uh, and then the starting starting pitcher. And we that's where I would have my report. And typically I would lead the meeting unless the starter himself wanted to lead it then i'd let him obviously but mm -hmm. you have the the other coaches and the pitcher we'd all kind of chime in during that meeting it wasn't just this is how we're going to do it this is my game plan so right. we're going to go about it and then after we do that meeting then you get ready to for the game so i would grab something to eat get changed shower up whatever i needed to do and then i'd go out about 15 minutes before the starter wanted to start playing catch mm -hmm. uh and that's when i would do my routine to, and long, my route, to limber up like you know get clean get, yeah get warm and getting loose but that's when i would do my practice for the day i always had about a 10 minute routine that i would do oh some fielding practice too and yeah every day so i'd do some receiving drills to work on the framing and whoever i was catching that day uh let's take the a's from last year if i'm catching you know cole Irvin, i'm gonna work on getting underneath the ball because he's gonna be throwing that change up and the curveball down in the zone and his fastball he spots up pretty good but I really wanted to work my arm side because he's going to work that sinker change up down in that tunnel uh, to my arm side. So I'd really work with our catching coach on, you know, really fr the exact pitches I'm going to be framing that night with the starter is what I would focus on. Uh, and then I do a little touch and feel on blocking. Yeah. Um, and then I, and then I'd get into my throwing, my throwing work. And that's where I, I had a progression on how I do that. And those are kind of like my every, my everyday drills. That's and what I'm I, talking about, man. Like, imagine yeah. the life of a DH. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've seen it. I've seen it. it. Yeah. Believe, believe me, when I when I looked over at the position player circle before games, I'm like, dude, you guys are just you're playing. Obviously, they're get they get playing their work cards. Games. I know they're, they're, they're work too. But yeah, like, you they, know, they, they do their work, but it's like, <laughs> man, I, I feel like I've got so much I need to be doing and, and things like. Well, you that. didn't and mention that. one thing that's kind of funny because you you talked about you know, sort of game planning, like for the calling aspect uh, the game, the, the, the game calling aspect, the bit of framing, you talk even about blocking. What about the running game? Like, yeah. when does that come in? Is it just, so that, it just been that, like going away in baseball? So it's just not as much of a thing to think about or a little bit, but you know, I, I, I neglected to mention that. So when we're going through our meeting, um, going over the lineup, we talk about who the runners are, okay. um, you know, so then I'll be, and I, you know, and, that's where the and you'll do that even coaches. in the pitchers meeting. So when you when yes, because I want the starter to be aware, like aware hey, of it too. these three guys, these three guys are runners, um, and then our our game planning coach uh, would typically or manager in our meeting, uh, Mark Kotze, when we'd have our pre series meeting, he would say, uh, Whit Merrifield, you know, obviously he's their number one runner. He's big in second pitch. He's a big second pitch runner mm -hmm. or, you know, so we have the count breakdown of when everybody's running. And so you kind of know in the back of your head, 
the counts where guys really like to go. And, you know, obviously Witt's a bad, bad example because he's all over the map. He's a great base stealer, but uh -huh. a lot of, a lot of those medium range guys, they have certain counts where they like to run. And, um, you know, obviously a lot of it's off speed counts or, you know, but right. also one of the things that I started to check later in my career, being a guy who really struggled throwing the ball, um, I was not the best thrower. I, you know, I had years where I was pretty good, but that was always the weakest part of my game was my throwing. And so I really wanted to know, okay, is our starter high off speed percentage in any counts? So, you know, cause the other team has that data too. So if I know we're heavy off speed in, in Oh one counts, for example, that might be a time where those medium speed base runners try to go because they have that number. And for me, I always thought 70% of anything was like a hundred. Right. If we're going off of they're percentages, gonna, they're going to they're going to they're going to see that 70 and they're going to lock in on that. Yeah, because I, I'll take my chances if 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 300 is is Hall of Fame average. <laughs> right. Like <laughs> if we're going to go off percentages, nothing is nothing is finite. Right. So if I'm going to have something that that triggers out at 70 plus, I'm going to give that as 100 percent in my mind. And so mm -hmm. if the other team's going to do that. I'm ready for them to run in those counts. And you, then you can adjust your game calling or, you know, call for a pitch, you know, throw over and stuff. Um, I'm, in, I'm interested also, uh, I got the impression that a lot of the run don't run is very scienced out at this point. So they know your, uh, you know, times, your pop times. Uh, they know the pitcher's times to home and they know their their runner's times to second. And I feel like there's a lot where they're just like, eh, you're just not going to go on this guy. I see that mainly it seems like, bases are stolen on the pitcher i see like noah Syndergaard has like you know 20 stolen bases against you know and guys on the same team with the same catchers have nothing like that you know so it seems to me like the pitcher's time to home is a, a real big part of that sort of math is that has that been a big part of you like you know because you didn't have the strongest arm is that something you found too is like it was a little bit maybe a little bit more important how fast the pitcher was to home than, than you were to second Oh, hundred percent. You know, I played on teams where, you know, especially in the years where I really struggled um, throwing the ball, I, you know, our coaches would talk to our pitchers and they'd be like, look, you got, you got boat catching you today. You know, you got to be a little quicker to the plate than say Manny Pena, right. When I was with the Brewers and, and, and it's talked about and it's like, Hey, give me a chance. If you give me a chance, I'm going to be able to throw them out. If you don't give me a chance, I can't make up. I don't have the arm in the quickness that these other guys do. And so it goes into the pitcher's game plan as well as you got to know who's catching. Um, but for us, as far as the way we always talk about it, you never talk about the catcher, right? It's, mm -hmm. hey, the catcher could throw or, he, or, hey, he struggles a little bit. So we might be able to take some chances if that guy gets up into a one three five one four, we might take a shot and hedge on him not making a great throw. But you're never going to run off guys that are one two one two five. You know, if they're staying under that one three five, it shuts down the non-base stealers, right? You got the guys that are going to run no matter who's pitching, no matter who's catching, they're going right. to get their bags or they're right. going to take their shot. But really what you're trying to do with the running games, you're trying to cut down the medium runners, right? Base stealers are going to get their bases. And if everything goes well and the pitcher gives you a chance and you make a good throw, you, you still have a chance to throw them out. But yeah. you want to shut the running game down from the other guys. That's really where then, you want to shut the game down. And that's my theory about the new rules. It's the people that will run the most relative to what they used to run with the new rules are going to be the medium guys. Cause you're, we're giving them three to four feet on the base path. Right. And they have a go, no go. That was very, you know, that was kind of tight anyway, you know, and if we give them three or four feet, that go, no go, you know, is different. Trey Turner's go, no go is every time. You know, yeah. if he wants to go yeah. he can go you know yeah so my theory is that like these guys like Luis Urias or um you know these guys who have good speed that stole like three or four bags in the past they might steal as much as eight or ten you know and like double their stolen base output because that go no go line is going to change and it and it's more about the base path being shorter and the pitcher than it is necessarily about yours your throws to, to second yeah uh, you're exactly right and now especially with the the only two disengagements and the pitch clock and, you know, the long hold step off the long hold pitch, the quick go um, pitchers are really going to have to learn how to control the game differently. And, and I know it's, it's going to take care of itself over the next few years, right. Or even the next few months, but 
I think you're going to see a lot more teams being being aggressive on the bases and especially early, yeah. Especially early to take advantage, and now with like the kind of the countdown of the pitch clock, you know, I think that's something that we're going to see, and I think you're also going to see a lot more pitchers using their better pickoff moves more often. You're not going to see the little lob over to first because now with only two disengagements, you're yeah, going to really have, have to, throws, you're, yeah. you're going to have to really, you're not, your intent is not to check on the runner. Your intent is to pick them off now. Yeah. And yeah. so it's going to change a lot, but I do think you're going to see those guys that are in the three to four range. They're going to, they're going to try a little more. And we all as base runners, I mean, when you say three to four, myself. you're talking about uh, times the second. Or just no, like stolen bases. Those guys oh, yeah, that are yeah, three yeah, to yeah, 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 yeah. three to five, you're going to see them up closer to ten. I think. I think you're going to see that. But we all, as base runners, no matter you know, even myself, as I got older, I had a number. And if the first base coach told me a number, now granted, towards the end, it was like, hey, I, he needs to be like a one six, one seven for me to go. But when I was younger, if the first base coach was like, hey, he's creeping up over a one five, then I was looking. That That's was the my, picture to home. Yes. Yeah. We're never, you know, cause you, you just got to assume he's going to throw, he's going to throw a one nine to a two Oh. Right. And yeah. you got your guys that can get down into the one seven, but you just, that's the catcher. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sorry. The, I'm, I'm being general here, but the pitcher, yeah, yeah. if I, if I heard a pitcher's time to the plate was over one five, I knew I had a shot. That's if it. I could that's get what it, I'm talking about. If I could yeah. get a jump yeah. and assuming that the catcher is going to be, you know, like I said, between the one nine and the two Oh, um, then you got to know if he's accurate or not. But the other element of that, too, is when a guy like me would take off, it's going to take the catcher by surprise. No one's <laughs> expecting me to go anywhere, right? And that's the ones that really get you is the ones that the guys just shock you out of nowhere. Yeah, when I modeled, but, when I modeled it, I was like, man, Albert Pujols, Pujols is so slow. How does he have stolen bases? It's like nobody's looking over there. <laughs> no, you've got, you do not have stolen base in your mind whatsoever um, when some of us are Motor over there. Went. Oh, crap. Throw yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's a, oh, crap, he's going. And then you rush your throw and throw it away. Yeah. It's beautiful. Um, so, uh, so when you, when you talk about that throw, um, yeah, I think there is like sort of maybe a line that you have to have, I got like a pop time you kind of have to have to be a major league catcher. So there's not that much variance. I mean, yes, JT Ramuto has a great pop time, you know, and, but there are also guys that catch that don't have great pop times. And the difference is not that much, you know, we're talking about like 0.2 seconds or something. So it's like not that much. Um, what could you do uh, to improve like, could you improve your accuracy? I saw this tweet by Jerry Weinstein where he's talking about spin access for, for catchers being important because, you know, ride from a pitcher to the plate is important, but you have even more space. So that means if you throw like a sinker to, to second base, that's not good, right? That's that's got sideways movement, makes it harder to catch. It, it takes away from you want to get it right. To, did you try to like throw four seamers? Did you look at grip? Did you did you do th certain things to try to get the most out of your arm? All, all of the above. Right. Yeah. Um, so for me, like being a, being a very average to below average arm strength guy, um, mm. my quickness and accuracy had to be there. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have the ability, you know, you look at a guy like Martin Maldonado, right? Like if you watch him throw, it almost looks like he's going in slow motion and then he just throws the ever living crap out of it. <laughs> um, and, and he's one of the best throwers that, that we've seen right like he's got one of the best arms and i love watching him throw i didn't have that skill set mm. my skill set was i had to be quick and accurate and how you how you do that obviously i worked a lot on my you know first step quickness i did a lot of agility work i really worked on quick transfers and i had to really work on getting a four seam grip and, and that's, and, that's and, like, that's like real quick. You have to sort of, you can't be like yeah. turning the ball in your hand. You have to sort of almost no. just get it. It's, you have to feel it. And as you're going up, you're changing as you know, I'll do it on screen, but it's like, as I transfer, I can feel where the ball is and, and get it to four it. seams as I'm going up. And that took, I mean, it's still, you know, you don't get it all the time, right. but how I would do that, how I would do that is whenever I was sitting around at the house, um, <laughs> I would, th I would kind of toss a ball up in the air. I'd catch it and get it to a four seam grip as quick as I could. Wow. I just, as I'm sitting there watching TV, I'd toss it up, try to get a four seam grip. Did you and, work on arm slot too? Like a pitcher almost? Like oh, all the time. Yeah. It? So I, you know, for me, like I said, everything for me had to be super efficient. And what I would do in the off season and I would 
draw a black line around a ball in a four seam grip. It just and do so, stuff like this. <laughs> yeah. And, but, but we're the same. Our throw, our throw is the most violent, difficult throw you have to make in baseball. And you don't have I mean, the benefit of the pitcher having the whole wind up and stuff. You're just doing it. Yeah, yours is it's, all arm it's, almost. There he goes. And you, your mechanics and your timing have to be absolutely flawless. And that's what helped me survive and throw the runners that I did throw out. Like I said, I, I'm never going to claim to be this great throwing catcher. I would never talk about myself that way. But I had to work really, really hard on my throwing and it got to the point where we were, I was trying to bounce. I was trying, whatever I could do, I had to continually adapt the way I did it, but I would draw that line on the ball and every off season, the whole winter, my throwing program would be with that ball because I wanted every throw to be able to see that spin where it's self-corrected. And I, I really helped me prolong my ability to throw and actually had a pretty good year in 21 throwing, if I remember right. But, um, so it was, keeps it on a line. It, it helps accuracy. It helps carry, so it, it doesn't go down into the ground. Yes. You know, like keeps keeps it on a, on a line right to the second yeah. baseman. Yeah, if you if you throw a major league ball without four seams, it will move. Yeah, it it will. Those balls those balls are designed to move. They're designed to to the spin to go. And you know, the other side of that too is over the years with experience, I could feel what my grip was. So if I had a two seam grip. I knew I had to almost throw a cutter motion to keep it straight. Or if I got and you like can a, do that, like I you're mean, like, oh, got the wrong grip. I yeah, got I got like the wrong now. grip. You can, you can, you can kind of feel how you have it, and you almost have to over pronate or try and cut or straight pull down. But wow. it, it, it's just those little adjustments that you're able to make in game. Or if you have that two seam grip, maybe I'm going to aim a little bit further yeah. to my glove side so that it can run back. So. You start to, I mean, like I said, that's that comes with experience, that comes with feel. And I was able to do that at times where I would feel the grip I had, so I would adjust my sights on the fly. Like in, like we said, this is happening in, what, 0.4 seconds? Um, mm. But that it's all the work and all the reps. <laughs> I mean, oh, my goodness. Like, uh, that's my favorite part about being a, being a coach now is I don't, you know, like, those are the things that I don't have to do anymore. Now I get to help. And, Try and impart the knowledge, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, do you do you anticipate sort of uh, changing uh, any of that? You talked about your prep, your game day prep. Do you think there'll be an added emphasis on the on the running game this year? And do you think uh, do you think how how different do you think baseball will look with the in terms of regards to the running game this year? I think there's going to be a lot more attempts. Um, I think there's going to be a lot more chances taken on the bases because. Like you, as you well know, it's all about statistical odds, right? Well, the yeah. odds just went, the odds just went back into the favor of the base runner. Mm -hmm. it, as marginal as it is, like, you know, I, one of the things that I'm starting to learn is how big 1% difference is over the course of 162. You're like, talking about that 70, right? Like 70 is on. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. And so like, as a, as a player, you or, know, you or you're those... talking about the pitcher the, to home, right? Like if he's 1.55, you're going. <laughs> yeah. If he's a one, four, five, I've got no shot, but if he's a one, five, five, I've got a shot. Like that's, that's a 10th of a second we're yeah. talking about. Right? <laughs> right. And, but that's, those are the things that you got to know and you got to understand. But um, for me, I think it's, if, if there can be 1% more stolen bases over the course of 162, that's a ton of stolen bases. And that's a lot of, a lot more runners in scoring position, a lot more opportunities to to score a run. But you're tasked with preventing that now. So, you know, like, uh, do, you, do you sort of, you're thinking about this, you're thinking about this and you're thinking about how, you know, how you're going to deal with it in spring. Good. Thank God we have spring training, right? Like you're going to have a month mm -hmm. to sort of see how it plays out and see how, you want to prepare with your catchers and uh... well, and I, I do think, um, you know, typically a lot of the organizations I've been with, they want everyone to steal in spring. They want you to push. The, like, there's a lot more stolen base attempts in spring training true. per game than regular season. Cause guys want to see how much they can push their limits. What, so what that's something to remember too. When we're watching is we're watching people test the limits of the new rules in spring. You know, I heard, uh, for example, that in the minors, when they did the pitch clock at the beginning, there was, you know, three or four um, uh, violations per game, you know, and it was really, really high. And everybody said, oh, my God, this might be too much. He said by I think it was by week five or six, they were down to less than one per game. 
And that, that was basically where it was the rest of the season. So, you know, when we were watching in spring, we're going to be like, oh, my God, there's all these like pitch clock violations and everyone's taking off. This game is going to be crazy. And there'll be a little bit of return to normalcy by like the last the third and fourth week of spring training. And that last week when you're like playing the showcase games against the other major league teams, like when you go back to San Francisco and do the Giants A's, you know, those games are going to be a little bit more what like baseball will look like in, in the coming season. Right. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, usually how it works is those last 10 days of spring training, everybody kind of locks it in a little bit more, right? Like the first two, three weeks of games, you're trying things. You're you're seeing if everything you worked on in the offseason paid off and you're like, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, I'm feeling that. And then those last 10 days or so, you really start to lock in, okay, I want to find what I want to do come opening day. And you're going to, so I think you're going to see a lot of violations maybe early, but um, you know, for the majority of, of pitchers and hitters, it's not going to affect the way things happen. It's not going to affect the way they've played the game. They're used to it. They're close to that. Well, border. You're lucky. You also have a pretty young team. So a lot of those guys like probably saw it. Yeah, for you sure. Know, like your pitchers probably saw the pitch clock, at least some, most of them. Yeah. And I, and I caught, I went down to AAA last year on a two week rehab stint. And so I got to catch four or five games with the pitch clock. And um, so I have experienced it a little bit and, and it's, it's a little bit, you get sped up just a little bit, but by the second or third hitter, I was fine, you yeah. know? Um, but that's, that's the easy part. By the way, my kids and... really liked it, man. We went to San Jose a few times and they were into it. I, I think, it, I think it'll be good for the game. I know that we haven't had a clock in baseball before, but this isn't like a clock to the end of the game. It's like just more about, you know, sort of speeding up the non-action moments or sort of getting rid of some of those and just sort of having play, you know, play, yeah. let's play. I, I'm a, I'm a old school baseball purist at so heart. You didn't like it at first. I can't stand the fact that we have a clock anywhere in the ball. Oh, you hate it. <laughs> I do. But, but, but I'm also, I'm also not naive and I'm like, we're losing fans. Yeah. we're losing fans it's a long game and, and it is like i people uh, you know i meet people all the time they're like oh i don't really watch baseball i'm like i don't blame you mm -hmm. you know like i i don't like it's a long game there's a lot of time if you don't understand the strategy and what's trying to go on it's Are a kids boring baseball? game yeah my my boys love it um my daughter plays fast pitch which that's a i'm telling you what fast that's pitch action. is a great game that's <laughs> yeah. a great game but um no but i think it is going to help the game it's going to take a lot of us some time to get used to have you talked to your boys be... about the pitch clock no they, they're a little young they're eight and six they don't really okay. understand it but yet um so they're starting up literally like my guys yeah so i mean my six-year-old would violate the pitch clock let's put it that way he, uh, <laughs> he he likes to come set 40 different oh, ways he's he's gotta, gotta, he's he likes to be there. johnny cueto and nice. i'm like hey Work on the balance, dude. We'll we'll clean that up when you come into a game, but uh, keep working on the balance. But um, no, I I, I do think I do think the pitch clock is going to be good for the game, and um, once we get used to it, it's going to take some time. All right. Well, I look forward to uh, seeing you when you come to town, and uh, good luck with the Mariners this year. And uh, thanks for for thanks for doing this. Yeah. No. Thanks. It was great catching up. All right, so uh, you know, really great stuff there uh, with you and Stephen. And thanks to Stephen for sitting down with us. Absolutely, yeah, uh, just really an insightful guy, and so interesting to hear about his new role and and how you know his skills as a catcher inform that and carry over. And uh, really uh, grateful that he shared a lot of those those insights with us here. Uh, so we talked before uh, we went to that interview about the the middle range of. Uh, of, of base dealers. And, you know, we talked a little bit about elite guys like Trey Turner, maybe O'Neill Cruz. Uh, we'll see. But as you've said a number of times, and as it came up in the interview, it's really in the middle where I think, you know, we could see a lot of the, the big gains. So I just want to toss out some names. And of course, if you, if there's anybody else you want to riff on or, or you know, uh, anybody else you think is relevant here, we can absolutely uh, steer in that direction. But one player I want to Maybe he doesn't really belong in this category, uh, but I, I do want to talk about him. And that's Andres Jimenez, because while he is, I think, elite or close to elite in terms of sprint speed and stolen base potential, he was sort of a middling guy last season. And the, the breakout was more with the power. And I'm very suspicious of him maintaining that power. So this is really it's a question about stolen base expectations, but also just about draft expectations for Jimenez, because I, I think 
people could maybe go a little bit overboard for seeing a big increase in stolen bases, a maintenance of the power uh, breakout that he had. What are your expectations for Jimenez uh, with, with everything that's in the environment this year? I'm hoping that more volume cleans up some of the regression in the power department. I am mostly out on him maintaining that power on a, on a rate basis. And I see, you know, 3% barrel rates before a jump to 6% last year. Usually you would even regress that. So I would predict something like a four and a half percent barrel rate for him next year, which is basically below league average for a starter. Um, and so that's why you see something like the bad X give him a 147 ISO and 15 homers. But those are all that's in 587 plate appearances. He had 557 last year. I don't see why a healthy young Jimenez with the job in hand to start the season, 24 years old, can't have the job all season. So I kind of think on a rate basis, he steps back, but he still manages 15 to 17 homers. And what, what does excite me is that elite sprint speed. Um, I did get into it where if you are drafting, uh, you know, this is sort of a little KDS conversation, but, you know, in, in NFC, you can choose where you draft. If you can choose your draft slot, what I found is if you're at the beginning of the front uh, of the of the first round, um, the second round, your second round picks um, are going to be old or starting pitchers. Uh, you either got Lindor or Paul Goldschmidt there. Um, or you're going to take a starting pitcher in the second round. Um, and I didn't really want to do that because I, I think the, there's a good 10 to 15 starting pitchers I like at the top. So so then I switched over to the back end, and I ended up starting with Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and Austin Riley, which I love as a one-two combo. Third base is a bit of a foobar position. Love all that. Didn't have any steals. And so I was a little bit in a panic for steals that I'm not normally in because I usually try to get 15 to 20 steals out of my first two guys and i didn't get that so i ended up drafting the middle infield for the the guardians with uh with getting rosario and um and jimenez and so i think just generally i would say that i'm not that in on jimenez but there's always a use case where it makes sense and uh you're right he has elite uh sprint speed he's up there with miles straw uh, he has, uh, he's just a little bit slower than Trey Turner. Trey Turner is 11th, uh, in time to first and actually a big tie there. So basically he's ninth, he's in the top 10 for times to first, which is a better predictor of, of stolen base speed than, uh, than just flat out sprint speed. So Andres Semenis is right there in the top 15. So, um, you know, he had an 85% uh, success rate last year. Uh, that's good enough to keep stealing. I think with the job in hand, with the, the rules making it better. And honestly, Stephen Kwan is right there. Stephen Miles Straw is there. If the Guardians did do this on purpose, they are really smart because right now they have three of the top 20 in sprint speed. Uh, no, Ahmed Rosario is there too. So four of the top <laughs> 20 in sprint speed on the same team. And they're loving these, these new rules. So maybe we'll have the go-go Guardians this year. And uh, I'll be happy to have Andres Jimenez in the middle of that. Now, uh, that would be a fun thing to watch. And another interesting storyline uh, from this offseason is Xander Bogarts becoming a Padre. And I think this could be a bit of a mixed bag for him because he loses that that Fenway Babbitt bump. Uh, and I, I wind up with Bogarts a lot, or I had uh, wound up with him a lot in the past because I feel like that was something that people overlooked was the stability of his st stone based, you know, as well. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, you know, the kind of the safety and stability of the batting average, the, all the run production possibilities. And so maybe he loses some of that, but yeah, maybe this year in this environment, he gets back to being a double digit stolen base threat. Do you see that for Bogarts? Well, team context is huge because he basically has the same time to first as Asturi Ruiz, uh, who is the, probably the new center fielder in Oakland. Um, I could see Oakland trying the go-go approach in terms of they have Ramon Laureano and the story Ruiz out there, Connor Capel can run a little bit. They've got, uh, you know, they've got some guys on that team, Nick Allen. They've got some guys who can run maybe, and they don't have really run producers from a power standpoint in the same ways of the teams. So maybe they'll just run. Xander Bogarts is going to be on a San Diego team um, that is pretty stacked. So I, I, one thing that is really sticky and really predictive is how often uh, teams run in the, in spring. However, this year, they might just be running to get used to the rules, right? Yeah. So uh, maybe just uh, track 
how often they run relative to the league not relative to themselves or relative to last year, uh, how, how often they run relative to the league, because maybe everybody will be trying out how to run. Because uh, Xander Bogus is right there in the middle of, I'd say the, if you're looking at times to first on Savant, 4-3, four, 4-4, four, four, and even 4-4.5 four, four right there, that's the kind of, uh, so for, for example, Xander Bogus is 111th best time to first um, out of uh 400 500 that i've got here so that's still top 20 you know top 20 percent you know and so you know that top 20 to top 30 percent i could see all number of different outcomes dancy swanson's in there um there's a whole bunch of of interesting names and so i think you're really gonna have to pay some attention to what the teams are doing all right well let's uh, talk about wander franco who was of course a huge topic of conversation this time in 2022 and so maybe not quite as much helium uh, on him this year, but maybe this is something uh, with, the, with the rule changes that actually could help him exceed his uh, draft position. Is that an outcome that you see? Yeah, you know, the, the Rays are a sneaky team for uh, taking for, for, for running on the on the bases. Uh, last year, they were 12th, which uh, doesn't sound like much, but it's still top, you know, top, almost top third. And it's basically in a, in a, in a, in a big bunch there. That's top third. And, um, you know, there were some progressive teams like the Dodgers and Yankees, um, you know, so they, they've decided that running can be a, a valuable thing for them. Cleveland, there, uh, number three, I kind of expect them now to be number one next year. Um, and, um, and so I think Tampa Bay runs enough where Franco could do. And then he's also in the right, uh, in the right percentage. He's got a four, two, eight to first base. Um, other guys that had a similar, uh, that had a similar time to first that took off a lot more. Ronald Acuna Jr. Had the same time to first had 28 stolen bases. Randy, Randy Rosarain on the same team at the same time uh, and stole tw- and stole 30 bases. Uh, John Birdie had the same si- time to first and stole 34. So that is absolutely a, a, the type of speed that can steal 30 bases. I think the question is, is he going to be too valuable to the team? And sort of the Byron Buxton question, you know, are we seeing a guy who gets injured a lot? If he is a guy that gets injured a lot, which I don't think that, I think that's still open for debate. Then do we want to keep him as as safe as possible by not running so much? Because he seems he's so important. Yes. They have all these mixed parts, but if they want to be a world series type team this year, it needs to be with Wanda Franco kind of taking the next step and being like a five win player, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I think they could be a good team that loses, you know, in the first or two, second round of the playoffs without that, but they need Wanda Franco if they're, if they're going to take that next step. And so they may just say, Hey, we're fine with you, you know, in some spots, but we don't, we don't want 30 stolen bases from you. Well, let's take a look at a, a, another player who's, sort of in that same situation of, of a centerpiece of the team's offense, maybe can't uh, really be counted on to, uh, you know, be stealing bases because he's, he's needed for thump, but Javier Baez coming off of a, a really disappointing season on a team that's probably not really going anywhere this year. Uh, but what do you see for him? I mean, it's a complicated question, obviously, because there's bounce back potential. There's the team context, but this, you know, new environment for stolen bases could at least be seen as a positive for bias. Yeah. The, you know, there's a limit to taking last year's stats and, um, and, and compa- and using them like, like I just did with Tampa because uh, there's always change in team personnel. And there's also change in who's running the team. And the tigers are being run by uh, Scott Bush. I got that right. Yeah. Scott Bush. Right. Um, yeah. Who used to be with the giants. And so you could look at the Giants and say, oh, well, they were 22nd in, in, in stolen bases last year. Well, the Giants are a really old team. And the Tigers are trying to be a young team uh, that are coming together. And I think you you pointed out uh, to me that uh, Spencer Torkelson uh, has a decent time to first. Uh, yeah, 4-5 is uh, you know similar to guys like Ryan McMahon, who had seven bases, and Kyle Schwarber, who had seven stolen bases last year. And I think this is absolutely four or five is absolutely right there at the break even point of should I steal this base or should I not? Do I have enough speed? Uh, and so 2% extra success rate could totally help. So now you've got this young team um, and, and a new executive who's in town who has done things a certain way. And they are, I think, making moves that remind me of the Giants. 
Uh, but at the same time, they're a younger team with younger players and obviously want to bank some wins in their first year. You know, you want to arrive and make a, a good impression. And then the, the personal context, it, it's almost like divination a little bit, this stuff where you're just trying to figure out, you know, what the motivations are, what the team is. But I think the personal context for Javier Baez is he wants to have a monster season. You know, yeah. like he had a terrible first season in the big contract. He must feel really bad about that and the team was bad and he had you know one of his worst seasons i would think that he wants to come back next year and you know at least go 2020 yeah and he's just at a stage in his career where i just i i can't quite comprehend falling off the map to the degree that he did for for so much of 2022 so i i do like him as a bounce back candidate and I want to go to back to a player that you just mentioned in passing, John Birdie. And I'm going to couple him with Jorge Mateo because these are a couple of players. I think they were actually one and two in stolen bases last year uh, with Birdie not really having a, a regular position. Mateo, I think, getting a little bit more playing time. But going into this year on the depth charts, it seems like both players could struggle for, for plate appearances. And they're both I mean, players. Are absolutely the types of players that, that the teams are going away from, right? Right, exactly. So how do we approach them this year? Because they are both the, the sort of player that could be very beneficial for stolen bases with just, say, 250, 300 plate appearances, kind of like, you know, Draw Dyson was a few years back. Uh, but, but that sounds like a deep league use case rather than somebody wanting to draft them in 12 and 15 team leagues, right? Well, I, I think you could make an argument for maybe reserve round, late round, especially a 15 teamer, maybe even 12 teamer if you're not but happy with so, their stolen. Like they 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 like itch, they make my they make my spine <laughs> shiver. They're like they're, they're just like not not my kind of player. You know, <laughs> like just not my kind of player. Like just like not great contact. Birdie at least takes walks and um and I think, you know, Mateo could have the same sort of uh, utility aspect where you can play him everywhere. He obviously can play it short, which means that, you know, he could probably play any middle and field position. He's played center in his past. So, you know, Mateo and Birdie could be on, like if I'm running a team, I can have them as my utility guys. And in fact, having a really fast utility guy is really fun because if you do make the playoffs, then you have that like, or if you you have a ghost runner situation, you know what I mean? Like you you want a pinch runner, like like it's teams. That's why Gerard Dyson has like three rings, right? <laughs> it's like everyone calls you in September. Um, so I, I, they would they definitely have a place on my team as utility guys. But would they start for my team? I'm not sure that these rule changes make like change their profile as a player enough to make them start for my team. Even though both of them were above two wins last year, you know. So. Um, I, 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 I accept my biases. I accept that I could be wrong, but I would rather, um, you know, take a chance on more, more well-rounded players, I think. Yeah. Well, and again, that's generally been my approach. Uh, these are both players, at least at current ADPs that you could take that late round or reserve round flyer on. But I, I hear every, see everything you say there, <laughs> uh, you know, about, uh, having some second thoughts about doing that. So, uh, with that said, uh, we're going to wrap up here. Uh, if you've got any questions for us, we're both on Twitter, of course. Uh, you know, you can find him and should follow him if you don't already at Eno Saris. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Al Melchior BB. And there's a brand new email for the Rates and Barrels show here, uh, ratesandbarrels at gmail.com. So you can also reach us there. And then one final programming note here we'll be back uh, on Monday with a pitcher breakdown request line. So uh, with that said, thank you, Eno. Thank you, Stephen Vote, And thank you all for, uh, for joining us here. We'll be, uh, we'll be back next week. Thanks for listening.